Good morning, everyone, and I'm del delighted to welcome you all, particularly our speakers, Tim Bouvery and Jennifer Griffin, to what I was about to say is a stormy Charleston Literary Festival, but it actually hasn't turned out quite so stormy. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the sponsors of this event, Allah and Ralph Isham. So Tim Bouvery is the author of the highly praised and groundbreaking history, Appeasement, Chamberlain, Hitler, Churchill, and The Road to War, published in 2019, a reappraisal of the British attempts to avert World War II by placating Hitler. I mentioned the publication date, as since the book's release, a desperate war is now raging again in Europe, this waging, being waged again in Europe, this time between Putin's Russia and Zelensky's Ukraine, with weapons supplied by America and its NATO allies. So the focus of this session will be considering this conflict through the lens of the lessons that can be applied and the parallels that can be drawn by, the period, by considering the period of appeasement that preceded World War II. So we're very privileged to have with us this morning Jennifer Griffin, the American journalist who works as a national security correspondent at the Pentagon for Fox News, and she's going to, and they're both going to discuss this urgent contemporary issue. Having recently reported from Lvov and Kiev, Jennifer brings the immediacy of the war to Charleston. So I'm going to hand over to Tim Bouvery and Jennifer Griffin. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. It's an enormous pleasure to be here. I, and thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for uh, doing this event with me. I've been asked to speak a little bit about my book for about 10 or 15 minutes before we get into uh, a dialogue and then some Q&A. There have indeed been a number of very good books about appeasement and about the lead up to the Second World War. However, I thought that they were limited in two important respects or ways I wanted to approach the subject differently. Firstly, that they tended to focus on purely the latter period, the 1938 Czechoslovak crisis into the lead up and uh, cause of the Second World War declared on the 3rd of September 1939, or to focus through a single character, such as Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain or Winston Churchill. Uh, what I wanted to try and do by contrast was to begin a book which started in January 1933, the year when Hitler came to power and to see how the British, the French, and to a lesser extent the Americans, because of course America was highly isolationist at that time, dealt with the emerging and then increasing Nazi threat, and to see how attitudes changed in real time. And it's that real time which was, I hoped, to be the focus of the book. Before I managed to get into lots of archives, and the main new archives I got into related to the British aristocracy, who in sort of ways which you would understand if you've seen the film or read the book, Remains of the Day by Kasia Irigushu, was uh, highly involved in amateur diplomacy, trying to effect and broker peace deals, having tea with it. But it, it was astonishingly easy if you had any sort of English title or connection to an English politician to meet Hitler. The, the, the Nazis had a warped idea, not least through this amateur diplomacy, that British foreign policy was determined not in uh, Parliament and the Foreign Office, but in fact in aristocratic salons and drawing rooms. And so uh, that, that was an aspect that I wanted uh, uh, to bring out before. But before I'd even got into looking at this new material, I thought that I wanted to try and stitch together the diaries, and the 1930s was the greatest era of diary writing in Britain since the 17th century. The diplomatic correspondence, which is beautifully written and often highly entertaining. Whatever British diplomats lacked in strategic nous, we made up for in beautiful prose. <laughs> and uh, also the, the newspaper reportage, which was um, of a very high quality, to make the reader feel that they were experiencing the moral political dilemmas that contemporaries were. We all know that the 1930s ended in the greatest war that the world has ever known. But contemporaries didn't. They might have suspected it, they might have feared it, 
but they did not know that it necessarily had to end that way. And if you were, I'm going to now try and uh, see if the slides will um, move on. If, if you had got to the stage of, um, sorry, we've gone too far. If you had got to the stage of addressing this man when he came to power in January 1933, a mere decade and a bit after one million of your fellow countrymen and Commonwealth citizens had perished in the First World War, would you not have tried to do everything possible to avoid another conflagration which, through the development of aerial technology and bombing, threatened to be even worse and threatened to affect the civilian population of the British Isles and indeed the whole of Europe in ways that the First World War simply couldn't? Of course you would. I think we all have innate sympathy with the desire to avoid war. The great difficulty, and I hope that it's something that uh, Jennifer and I might discuss in a little bit, is at what stage does your very commendable desire to avoid a war actually make a war more likely? At what stage is your attempt to, re to meet the grievances of aggressive bullies merely encouraging them and merely making them stronger, merely delaying the day when you will in fact have to stand up to them and possibly in less favorable circumstances? I just want to uh, touch on a couple of uh, the myths which I tried to uh, unpick in the course of my book, and, and then I'll get, uh, hand over to Jennifer. The first one is, say, I think a lot of people believed that the true horrors, or, or still believe today, and ha have since the Second World War, believed that the true horrors of the Nazi regime and the character of the Hitlerian government was somehow shrouded until the end of the Second World War, until the death camps were liberated and the Holocaust uh, was revealed in, in all its horror. That was fundamentally untrue. The first German national act against the German Jews occurred in April 1933, two days after Hitler, two days, sorry, two months after Hitler came to power, uh, a national pogrom of all Jewish shops and businesses, and this was enormous news. There was a mass demonstration in Central Park in New York. There were demonstrations across the British Isles. There was an absolute cottage industry of journalism, uh, uh, books coming out, the most famous of which was something called The Brown Book of the Hitler Terror and the Burning of the Reichstag. Later on, a very well-known Australian historian called Stephen K. Roberts wrote a book called the house that Hitler built, and he had, was a journalist who was based in Nazi Germany for, for many years before, and this was read by Neville Chamberlain and others. The evidence was presented to the statesman. Neville Chamberlain wrote to his sisters, having just read this book in January 1938, so that is only eight months before the Czechoslovak crisis really blew up. He said, if I accepted these, the author's conclusions, and the author's conclusions were that the Hitler government could not possibly achieve its foreign policy aims without a major European war, if I accepted the author's conclusions, I should despair, but I don't and won't. So there was an enormous amount of uh, evidence before the decision makers as to the character of the Nazi regime, but I, that last moment I wanted to, to, wanted to uh, that last point leads me on to a couple of the myths about Neville Chamberlain, which I uh, will just finish up with before handing over to Jennifer. I think, popularly, the concept of Neville Chamberlain is that he was a weak prime minister who gave in to the bullying of the fascist dictators uh, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. Nothing could be further from the truth. Neville Chamberlain was one of the strongest, most ruthless prime ministers in British political history. He used the full apparatus of his power to achieve his political objectives while he was in office, including using the security services to spy on his political opponents, including Winston Churchill, whose telephone he tapped. He was absolutely determined that reasonable diplomacy and face-to-face -face encounters with these dictators could somehow mellow them. And I think that this is a fault which statesmen have got into prior to the 1930s and since, a belief that your own personal charisma and negotiating skills can somehow overcome massive, entrenched foreign policy or ideological aims or fixations. And finally, I would just end with what uh, the 
the central and overwhelming and repeated myth of the appeasement period, which has just been repeated in a famous film called Munich, uh, which starred uh, Jeremy Irons. I haven't seen the film, but I know that this was the, I'm aware of the concept and I know what the final credit was, which was that by appeasing Hitler, Neville Chamberlain gave the rest of the world, in particular Britain and France, who were going to face the brunt of standing up to Nazi Germany, an extra year in which to prepare and rearm. That, in as far as it goes, is true. Britain was woefully unprepared for war in 1938. Radar, the Spitfires, the Hurricanes, everything that made the difference between victory and defeat in the Battle of Britain was not ready at the time of the Czechoslovak crisis, the Munich Agreement, but was ready in September of the following year. However, what this entirely ignores is that Germans themselves were not ready for a major war in 1938, and that a year in Britain is also a year in Germany. And if you go through the figures, it's fairly clear that the Germans outarmed the British and the French in the crucial year between 38 and 39, while the geopolitical, strategic, diplomatic situation enormously worsened. Although there are very good reasons for distrusting Joseph Stalin as Churchill himself later discovered, and certainly uh, FDR, had he lived, would have discovered. The overwhelming foreign policy of the uh, objective of the Soviet Union was not to have the uh, highly militaristic, highly anti-communist, national socialist government of Germany encroaching further and further east. They might, not, they might have distrusted the capitalist countries of the West uh, almost as much, but they certainly didn't want to have Hitler moving into Czechoslovakia, uh, Russia's treaty ally beforehand. And so although the, uh, it, it is a moot point, and we can never possibly know what Stalin would have done had the West stood by the Czechoslovaks in 1938 rather than abandoning them as they did, it seems fairly clear that the least one could have expected is a benevolent neutrality rather than the conclusion which Stalin did draw, which is that the West would never stand up to Hitler, that the West was trying to get him to move east, that the West would love to see a fight to the death between these twin appalling ideologies and regimes, uh, Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia. And so the inevitable consequence, of course, was uh, Stalin moving into the German camp, and it was by the, through the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of August 1939 that uh, set the stage for the war that was to come. So those are just a few of the points that I tried to uh, make in the book, and um, I will oh, now hand over to Jennifer. Amazing. Well, first of all, Tim, thank you. What an incredible um, overview of this book, which I spent last week in reading, and I can tell you it's an outstanding book. Um, I had a lot of emotions reading the book because I felt a great deal of anxiety because of the similarities to what we appear to be seeing unfolding in Europe right now. And I, I want to delve into that, but I also want to say that the person who approached you in New York had the same question I had because, you know, a lot of historians have tackled appeasement. And I'm just wondering, were there any historic documents that you found that, were, that had not been revealed before that were particularly informative in terms of this, this book? I found... Uh a number of documents relating to the, an organization called the Anglo-German Fellowship, which was a group of highly placed British industrialists, businessmen, bankers, parliamentarians, and aristocrats who went out to Germany and visited uh, things like the, if I could go back on this slide, visited the Nuremberg Rally. This is from the 1935 Nuremberg Rally, and were amazed. There were people who were swept up with what was happening in thought that it was a good thing. They might have thought that it was a, that the, that somebody once asked uh, one of the members of the Anglo-German Fellowship, uh, a Germ this is a German diplomat, asked him, what, what do you in England really think of us in Germany right now? And the um, uh, gentleman who was a sort of minor aristocrat and politician said, well, I think we would say you're quite eccentric. And he said, eccentric? What do you mean? He said, well, all this... Um, but uh, Heil Hitler saluting. I mean, we think that's a bit, a bit gauche, really. It, um, <laughs> and yet, the, re the, it, you, you, the, the, the old um, Arab proverb about my enemy's enemy being my friend, etc., did apply in the sense that most people in Britain and in America at that time as well feared communism more than they feared fascism. And communism, at least, was aspiring to a world revolution, whereas fascism wasn't looking so obviously to export its ideology, even if it had territorial aims. 
And so the theory that these people had was that to have a very large anti-communist bloc in the central of Euro center of Europe uh, was, was helpful. So I, I came across a lot of documents which revealed their motivations and their naivety, frankly. And at the same time, I, by going into some of the uh, archives which had never been opened up before, so for instance, those of the Duke of Buccleuch, who was and remains the largest landowner in Europe, and his, his papers uh, had never been seen before. Um, you don't, by the way, if any of you are thinking about uh, exploring this subject for yourself, it, it's quite difficult, uh, or you tend to get a fairly stony response if you knock on some uh, great baronial hall and say, I'd really like to see uh, the, your grandfather's diaries to see quite how close he was to the Third Reich. Um, yet they, you, tend not to, you tend not to get a good response. What you had to do is, what I had to do was end up writing these quite Orwellian letters saying that I was writing a book about uh, international relations during the 1930s with a particular focus on the social, uh, diplomatic, political side. You make the book sound as boring as possible and you don't mention the word Nazis or Hitler at any moment uh, during it. Good tip. <laughs> I want to read to you some of the th notes I took from your book and tell me if any of this sounds familiar. So you talked about how Hitler believed that he could bomb London and London would be destroyed in just a few days. There was talk about Hitler's mental condition and doubts about his mental condition. Uh, need for national honor to be restored in Germany. Uh, reoccupation of the Rhineland was viewed as inevitable by many in the West, uh, did not pose a direct threat to Britain, so why get involved? Uh, there was a cabbie who Anthony Eden, Anthony Eden spoke to who said he, Hitler, can do what he likes in his own backyard. And then there was the 1936 German referendum. There was a referendum of 99, 98 or 99% voted in favor of retaking the Rhineland, and um, it just goes on and on. What parallels should we be taking as you're reading the news coming out of Ukraine and out of Europe? You're a historian who studied this period. What strikes you? Well, I think the main thing that strikes me where the parallels relating to this period, there are separate parallels to which people can explore about the war itself, is how did we get here as opposed to how do we get out of here? How do we get out of here is the is the million dollar question which if I knew the answer or whoever knows the answer could, would rightly receive the Nobel Peace Prize. But how we got here and the links to what happened in the 30s I think is very interesting. A, a, a central theme of my book which I was not, I did not go into believing until I had d done the research was how overwhelming the evidence was of Hitler's intent prior to the unleashing of the Second World War. He wrote it in Mein Kampf, for goodness sake. It was there. He only wrote one book, and, well, actually, he wrote, he wrote, a, he wrote a second book, but that wasn't, pu wasn't published during his lifetime. He wrote one book, and he controlled the copyright of it, so, because he didn't want people in the West reading what he'd written. I mean, he'd written about, very clearly about his intention to exterminate uh, Judaism. He'd written very clearly about his desire to carve out a new German empire in the East, He'd written very clearly about his, the necessity of destroying, he actually used the word annihilating France, before he did this. All of this was there, and a, it's, I found it completely astonishing that the few people who did read sections of it in Britain ignored it and said, well, he wrote this in 1922, when he, to 1922 to 1924, when he was in prison. He's now chancellor. Once you're in power, you become much more responsible. I heard people saying that about an American there's, president. There's once. always... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, there, there's always cognitive dissonance, isn't there? When, in, when you're in the historic moment, I think people do not like to believe the worst about people. And also, wasn't the translation not fully translated into English? Of no, it was, so, so, the, so the, the Germans used to say, oh, you can't, whenever anyone raised Mein Kampf, they would say, you can't pay any attention to that. That, that, um, that book is old, that, that's juvenilia. He wrote it when he was a young firebrand, to which one person at least said, well, if it's irrelevant, why is it required reading for every German youth at this moment? But the, but the version which was published in Brit Britain was only a third of the length of the original. And so all the rather boring bits about him being a soldier in the First World War and being a very bad uh, bourgeois painter in Vienna th thereafter were left in, and all the bits of 
and then I will take over the rest of the world with cut out. <laughs> but, but the evidence was there Minor despite details. that. Minor yes. details. Um, I'm curious about the role of the media during this period, and media barons during this period, and newspapers at the time. Um, what did you find in terms of them laying the groundwork for appeasement? There was a, a news chronicle poll that you quoted in which 86% of those polled, this is the public, believed that Hitler did not uh, did not believe, excuse me, did not believe that Hitler did not have greater ambitions. So the public knew that Hitler was, had greater ambitions than just the Rhineland, and yet that poll was suppressed by the owner of that newspaper. What did you find in terms of the media's role? I think, yes, uh, the media's role is fascinating, and that has big lessons for today. That poll, by the way, I should say, came quite late in, I think that came in 1938, when Hitler was saying that the Sudetenland, this German-speaking area, not entirely German-speaking, but largely German-speaking area of Czechoslovakia was uh, under uh, Hitler's threat. Prior to that, there were major media organizations which did not, as Winston Churchill enjoined the British government to tell the British people the truth. They concealed and they lied. And they did this for a variety of reasons. So, and I'll, I'll mention three. There were the Beaver Book Press, which uh, sold uh, the Express, uh, the Rothermere Press, which owned the, the Daily Mail, and the BBC. Now, the BBC was totally different, but the BBC had a monopoly. Uh, 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 it's different in the sense of the reasons for it acting the way it did. It, were, it had a monopoly on broadcasting, and it had been set up by the state, and the first ever director general of the BBC had this appallingly warped sophistry, which went along the lines of, the BBC has been created by the government, the government has been elected by the people. The people chose the government, therefore the BBC must support the government. I mean, it, it was very warped logic, and so they, th there was very little independent reporting on the BBC. There is a problem, or certainly was then, and there may still be now in the world, with very rich individuals controlling media organizations, <laughs> um, which is that they are often very motivated by their own wealth. This is what happened in, I'm not making a, a, a judgment about t t today, although you may um, infer one if you, if, if you like. But at the time, the anti-communist paranoia of these Beaverbrooks and Rothermere's was extreme, because they've got the most to lose. That's why so many of the uh, appeasers were on the right, and the landowners, and so much the aristocracy. You've got the most to lose from, from a war, with taxes going through the roof, you've got the most to lose if a war is going to possibly bring about a communist revolution. That is what happened when war happened, occurred in Russia between 1914 and 1917. And these people were hyper paranoid about communism. Uh, Lord Rothermere would, had bought estates in Hungary where he was going to move if he thought that there was going to be a communist revolution in Britain. Lord Beaverbrook had on the banner of the Daily Express throughout most of the 1930s saying there will be no war and just advocated isolationism. So th these people had a lot to lose by a war and I think this led them to a, a campaign of dissimu dissimulation and suppression. Mm. I was very interested in what you wrote about the amateur diplomats and the role that they played at the time in terms of going to Germany, meeting with Hitler, Hitler's wonderland, going to Dachau to, uh, on tourist uh, tours from Britain. And it, I, it made me think of some of the more recent amateur diplomats who have been in the news of late in the last uh, five or so years, even more recently, but I couldn't help but think about uh, General Mike Flynn and Jill Stein. Uh, Mike Flynn had been director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Jill Stein, um, head of the Green Party back in uh, 2015, they went to Moscow at the invitation of, of Putin and uh, RT, which was a front, of course, Russian television, paid them tens of thousands of dollars to sit at dinner with Putin. And this was after the invasion of Crimea in 2014. This was a year afterwards. Um, and I'm just wondering, I was thinking of the sort of role of amateur diplomats now in terms of undermining a united front and appeasing, if you will, and, and what you saw at the time in some of the characters who were the great appeasers uh, on the periphery. Well, I think it's a fascinating question, and one thing unites the amateur diplomats that you're talking about and the amateur diplomats that are in this book, and that is the phrase which 
some say is apocryphal, but I'm pretty certain he did say it, which is what Lenin said about the fellow travelers of communism in the West. They are useful idiots. <laughs> and that, 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 that is the role these people uh, play, because they give uh, legitimacy. They are often seduced by their ego, dinner with the president. They're seduced by money. They've got curiosity. A lot of the people who went out to Germany to try and conduct amateur diplomacy, w which I uh, really nominally important people, people who had money, but not officially important. They were actually misfits and had missed their opportunities for political success and hoped to gain it. And while people in Britain wouldn't give them the time of day for their views on foreign affairs, whatever, they suddenly felt th themselves fated by uh, the National Socialists who thought that they had much more influence. And it, it, it's, it's um, deeply unfortunate that it allowed and exacerbated a, a, a sense in Germany and possibly and would have done the same in uh, Putin's Russia that the West was not sincere in its desire to stop aggression or would eventually uh, have a red line, that these, these people who are going out uh, making, making noises, it muddies the waters. And it's serious, it muddied the waters in Germany to the extent that when Edward VIII abdicated the throne in 1936, Hitler refused to believe that it had anything to do with a twice-divorced American called Wallace Simpson. He was convinced that this was an anti-German plot to get rid of a pro-German, pro-fascist monarch. And he, he wouldn't hear anything, uh, anything else about it. It, it breeds conspiracy theories. Mm, mm, interesting. What role did you find that anti-Semitism played in the aristocracy, the ruling class, in terms of laying the groundwork for appeasement? That was part of what you really delved into. Yes, it's a really difficult question. And it's one that, because it's uh, nuanced. And in this day and age, it's very hard to talk about something as vile and rightly emotive as anti-Semitism with nuance. But there is nuance here, in that a lot of the British ruling class was what I would describe as socially anti-Semitic. They would make jokes and slighting remarks about Jews which are disgusting, entirely unacceptable in these days, but in those days were not called up, were not considered such in that nobody would suddenly storm out of a dinner party and say, you can't say that about a Jewish person, that's appalling, I'm off. It, it was accepted. And they would occasionally try and make excuses for what was happening in Germany. They would buy into, uh, the useful idiots would buy into Goebbels' propaganda that the Jews had become too prominent in Germany, that they had taken over high finance to too great an extent, that they got the best seats at the theater, all rubbish. But they were trying to find excuses for this. On the other hand, there was, throughout the 1930s, a fully Jewish member of the British cabinet, Leslie Hall Belisha, uh, so, and uh, one of the most popular conservative ministers who had a huge political salon was uh, uh, called Sir Philip Sassoon. There were other leading members of society who were Jewish. And, what, and so that is a huge difference. In Germany, they would have been thrown out of their office and later put in death camps. In Britain, they were allowed to be in the cabinet. And secondly, when the German persecution of the Jews got really serious, most people turned. And most of the people who had, made, who had been apologists for anti-Semitism in Germany turned. Most people who were socially anti-Semitic turned. And actually, therefore, I, as I argue in the book, the biggest shift of opinion regarding Nazi Germany was not the Munich crisis of September 1938. It was Kristallnacht, which happened in November 1938. And then at that point, people who had filled their diaries with slighting remarks or jokes about the Jews, which we would consider completely unacceptable, were aghast and appalling and saying, this is medieval, this is barbaric, how can they be so good? What are they thinking? Some of the people who, some of these amateur diplomats changed their mind and wrote letters to Ribbentrop, to Goering, even to Hitler, saying, you, the greatest barrier towards a rapprochement between Britain and National Socialist Germany is not your desire to possibly start a new world war by grabbing bits of Poland or Czechoslovakia. It is your treatment of the Jews. So it, it, it's a difficult question, but mm. it is nuanced. And, and was Chamberlain anti-Semitic from your research? I, ha I found no evidence that Chamberlain is anti-Semitic. I found no evidence of Chamberlain saying anything, expressing any great 
sympathy for the Jews, but I found, I've never found an instance of him saying anything anti-Semitic. W- one thing he said quite early on, I mean, Neville Chamberlain, by the way, was not a Rothermere, a Lord Londonderry, or a Beaverbrook, or any of these people who were pro-Nazi. He detested the Nazis. He thought that Hitler was, quote, the commonest little dog he had ever met. And in 1934, when he, before he was prime minister, he wrote a letter to his sisters in which he said, I, I really don't know what we're going to do about Germany until the Jews get their act together and shoot Hitler. So he, was, uh, he, he, he understood that, that there was obviously a motive for this. Do you think that appeasement was inevitable, or do you think that if Chamberlain had not been in that position, or do you think if Chamberlain had not been prime minister, appeasement because of the mood at the time was inevitable, or do you think it was really driven by the personality of Chamberlain? It's a fascinating question, and the answer is is a bit of both. I think by the stage of 1938, the whole of appeasement had been built up for a very long time. The swiftness with which what was meant to be a British victory in the First World War and a French victory in the Second World War was being treated as a defeat, that this had been an appalling muddle, that it hadn't really been for anything, that so many of the things which actually had to happen in the late 30s to try and avoid a Second World War were were prescribed in the late 20s and early 30s because it was thought that they caused war. For instance, having arms. Well, there was an arms race before the First World War. Well, if we don't have any arms, then we won't have an arms race. And if we don't have an arms race, we won't have a war. Okay, we'll get rid of our weapons. Uh, There was a build-up of alliances which clicked in after the assassination of France Ferdinand, that was dreadful. If we have no alliances, we don't have an alliance with France, we don't have an alliance with Czechoslovakia, we don't build up an anti-fascist coalition, then there won't be that uh, automatic uh, domino effect leading to war. And yet Chamberlain was utterly determined that what he was doing was right. He continued to believe that appeasement was a solution up until the actual declaration of war in September 1939, and I find it impossible to believe that had he not been Prime Minister and someone such as Winston Churchill had been Prime Minister, that the Munich Agreement uh, would have been agreed to by Britain. I think it is much more likely that Britain would have gone to war a year earlier, but uh, obviously that's a counterfactual that cannot be proven. Well, it's so interesting looking back, and it's so easy to connect dots when you look back in history, and I've just been looking back as a journalist at, at sort of recent history and areas in which NATO and the US did not react to, to uh, Putin's moves, uh, whether you look, and, and the sort of as we look at the road to February 24th of this year. And if you look at, of course, 2014 and Crimea, the invasion there. But if you go back to uh, 2008 and the invasion of Georgia, we didn't really respond there. Uh, Estonia, there was a major cyber attack around the same time uh, that was not really dealt with. Uh, from Russia. Russian forces in Syria, I remember when they first arrived on the scene, um, and the U.S. really did nothing to contain or stop them from setting up bases. And Syria really became like the Spanish Civil War for Russia to try out their new weapons and their their, uh, military means, and the West really did nothing to stop them. And then more recently, China going into Hong Kong and then overnight just taking Hong Kong and no response from from the West. So these points, you have a a chapter in the book about Abyssinia. What role did those kind of moments in the lead up, the ignoring of of transgressions really play in the road to World War II? I I think it's hugely, important, all of the points you've mentioned, which were points at stopping, and and it wasn't like nobody said them. I think there was, it was, although a, a great fault of us as a society, not not journalists, uh, uh, but a fault of us as a society, that having paid an awful lot of attention to the uh, Syrian civil war, we'd got bored of it to an extent that once Putin really did go in and wreak utter carnage there, and turned an appalling situation into hell on earth, that that was hardly reported because, well, you, you, there was an idea that you'd had ISIS and Daesh by, by that stage. Everything's so awful out there that um, uh, whatever he's doing, he might be restoring some sort of order or we just don't want to know even. Um, but it was absolutely appalling. But all of these things are signals. It's, it's like a, a, a bully, and all of these people are bullies, you get encouragement and emboldened by what you are not stopped doing and all these transgressions. And that has certainly happened uh, with Putin and it, they don't even have to relate to you. So for instance, I think uh, Barack Obama and David Cameron 
drawing a red line in the sand about the use of chemical weapons in Syria and then doing nothing about it, not least thanks to David Cameron's ineptitude in losing a House of Commons vote on the subject, and then Barack Obama not doing anything himself about it, even though that is normally nothing to do with uh, Russia, it is a signal that the West is weak. And the same things were happening in the 1930s. If, I, if somebody said to me, OK, well, you're very critical of statesmen in the 1930s, could you give a hypothetical of when, what could they have practically done? Give a, one example I would say would be stopping the Italian invasion of Abyssinia in 1935. Uh, the Italians, as they proved in the First World War and then proved again in the Second World War, are wonderful artists, great cooks, and famous lovers, but they are not <laughs> uh, renowned for their fighting prowess. I actually remember in Afghanistan when the Italian troops would show up, they had attached to their belts a Lavazzo coffee maker. <laughs> and I thought, this may be a problem. <laughs> That, that there was a German joke during the second. There was a German joke during the Second World War that uh, somebody uh, rushed up to Hitler and said, um, uh, "My Führer, uh, Italy has declared war." And he says, "We don't need to worry about that. Send two divisions." He said, "No, they're on our side." He said, "That's much more serious. Send fourteen <laughs> divisions." <laughs> so. <laughs> the Italians, th this was the great test after the Manchuria episode of 1931, where Britain behaved very badly uh, under Sir John Simon, who I maintain, I can show you a picture of Sir John Simon. He is the man, uh, he, no, he's forward, forward. There, the bald man with a young Anthony Eden meeting Hitler, he was British Foreign Secretary, a man who I'd sort of written in the book at the time I was writing, uh, was, I thought, probably the worst foreign secretary in British history. But then, uh, uh, by the time I got to the end of the book, Boris Johnson had become prime <laughs> <and> foreign secretary. <laughs> so um, I, had to take I had to take that out. Um, but he was nevertheless a disastrous foreign secretary, not least because, he, uh, because of what happened in Manchuria. But then, an even bigger test was 1935. It was the test of the League of Nations. The League of Nations had been set up to forestall acts of wanton aggression against member states. Abyssinia was a member state, ironically, at the insistence of the Italians when it was originally put in there. The Royal Navy could have prevented Mussolini from even embarking on this adventure by blockading the Suez Canal. And yet the British and the French uh, effectively wimped out of it. They were terrified by uh, Italian bombers uh, sinking British capital ships. They worried that, uh, uh, that this was not the main theater of potential threat later, that was Germany, and that getting involved in some war in Africa with uh, the Italians was a very dangerous idea. And yet by giving in at this stage, it was purely encouragement to Hitler. And it is no accident that very swiftly, after the British and the French failed to do anything about the Italian annexation of, of Abyssinia and the use of chemical weapons uh, to defeat the spear-carrying Abyssinians that Hitler marched into the Rhineland in March 1936. And didn't uh, uh, German officers in Nuremberg in 1946 say that if France and Britain had, had teamed up and pushed uh, Germany out of the Rhineland, they would have retreated, and that could have been Certainly. a moment. The Rhineland, I think most historians agree, the, the reoccupation of the Rhineland was the last moment when the Western powers could have stopped Hitler without a major war. Uh, 22,000 German troops crossed into the demilitarized zone, and they were facing a French army of a million men. Uh, the appeasement is both then and now. I don't know if you agree with this, Jennifer. I think it is a, it is a mental attitude. And the and a projection and a that pro prevents deterrence. Exactly, and a belief that, and, and the dictators are very good at gaming this. They're very good at frightening us. We're being, we're being frightened right now, possibly with reason, about the idea of nuclear war and or uh, the use of a nuclear weapon. But it because might Putin, be a bluff Because also. Putin knows that that will scare us. Yeah. And the French army was terrified, France was terrified, Britain was terrified of another war after the end of the First World War. It never occurred to them that some of the Germans might themselves be terrified of a war, and that a very nascent German military buildup, which had happened by 1936, was no match at all for the French army, which could have dealt a decisive blow to Hitler, possibly, or certainly a, a major check, which would have made him lose face with his generals, who had all urged him not to remilitarize the Rhineland. But uh, it, it, th there was not the will in France to do it, and in Britain, because of this new era of democracy, and now we have to have uh, 
public opinion has to go along with us. This is the advantage dictators have. You can lock your dissidents up. You can ban your newspapers. That's what's happened. You can have really unpopular wars. It's very hard to have unpopular wars in democracies these days. And the British didn't feel that there was a causus belli. You, you gave the quote earlier that somebody said, well, Jerry can do what he likes in his own back garden. This is what a taxi driver said to Anthony Eden, uh, who had just become foreign secretary. And it really was Germany. It wasn't just Germany's back garden. It was Germany. This was The Rhineland was Germany. It wasn't like they had invaded another country. But it was by, recognized at the time by some perceptive individuals as a turning point. I, I think that historians will be looking at this period after February 24th, even prior to February 24th, in terms of what uh, the United Democracies could have done to deter Putin. Um, I think it's an open question mark. Um, um, there, I wouldn't even deem to weigh in at this point, and I wouldn't have wanted to be a decision maker at that time. Also, back to 2014, what if the NATO had responded and the U.S. had, had said, no, this is like they did in Kuwait with Saddam Hussein? It's really hard to know. Uh, but I think it also has made me start to think that democracies are really bad at deterrence. They can't, it, because we have uh, such an open society and it's hard to, to project a united front. Um, you have a quote in the book about how uh, dictators get a two year lead time to democracies. I've mangled the quote, but, but it, they, they really have, because it takes a while before democracies get organized. Democracies, NATO is holding together in Ukraine. It, it really is extraordinary. Um, but Putin is banking on that alliance breaking, breaking apart. Can I, can I just uh, say, so I think that is a fascinating point you've made. And I think one of the reasons, though, it, yes, democracies are scarred, and we're hesitant, and we're terribly hesitant. But we are often hesitant because of errors we have made ourselves, foreign policy errors in the past. And I believe this comes from a, a cycle of learning often the wrong lessons from the previous war. So I've already mentioned that the people in Britain and America and France learnt the wrong lessons from the First World War. They got rid of alliances, they got rid of weapons, America became isolationist, everyone became isolationist to an extent, and that was completely the wrong response when it came to the rise of fascism. At the end of the Second World War, everyone turned against appeasement and said, right, as soon as anyone steps out of line, we know what to do. And I've, got, I've got just given a lecture on uh, the legacy of appeasement. Every single uh, US president, Harry Truman over uh, Korea, uh, John F. Kennedy over uh, the Bay of Pigs and uh, communist, uh, communist spreading into, into the Caribbean as well as standing up to Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Lyndon Johnson over Vietnam in Britain, Anthony Eden over Suez, uh, both George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. over Iraq, uh, Ronald Reagan over Libya and Central America. All of these people have invoked the specter of Munich and how you go in hard, you go in early. And I don't think it would be too controversial a statement to say that at least half of the foreign policy ventures I've just mentioned ended badly with a diminishment of Western power, a diminishment of Western influence, and then you get the wrong lessons again. I mean, the, the irony of, oh, well, we went into Iraq because we thought that there were weapons of mass destruction and we couldn't have weapons of mass destruction used. Well, there weren't any. But now when a uh, dictator in the Middle East has got weapons of mass destruction and has just used them before our eyes and we're not going to do anything about it is, is, a, is a painful irony. You, it, this constant learning of the wrong lessons. I agree. I think the pendulum swings too far. And so I, that would, brings me to my, one of my last questions, which is, are we making a mistake by seeing Ukraine through the lens of appeasement? And are we missing opportunities to negotiate? Have there been off-ramps? You mentioned the nuclear threat. Perhaps, I'll just posit this, perhaps Putin threw that out there thinking that the West, that would bring the West to the negotiating table, but uh, Western leaders are so concerned about being seen as appeasers and with Zelensky in the lead, uh, are we missing opportunities to negotiate or is this, are, are, do we just have to wait and see how this plays out? It's an incredibly difficult question, and I couldn't, wouldn't pretend for a second to have the right answer. The only thing I will say is a general dictum, which I think is good, is a, a quotation. There, was no, there is no more famous, hence why he's a central figure in my book, no more famous an opponent of appeasement than Winston Churchill. And he said in 1946, a quotation which I'm not going to get quite right, but the essence is that appeasement from weakness 
is vile, it is craven, and it is uh, ultimately highly ineffective. Appeasement from strength can be magnanimous and possibly the surest uh, route to world peace. Right now, actually, NATO and the West and Ukraine, they are winning. There is, there, this, to, so any, to, to, and we in the West who are not, our, we're purely, uh, particularly in Europe, where we don't have our own uh, energy supplies, uh, having to only suffer higher bills. We're not ha being, having shells fired on us. And so I think we should be careful not to be more Ukrainian than the Ukrainians and damn any sort of attempt to end the war via negotiation. And most wars do end via negotiation, unless you want an absolute Armageddon, as happened at the end of the Second World War, and say, this can't happen, this can't happen, and that, that, that any sort of route, and I don't know what that route is, and I'm not advocating any, I'm not advocating appeasement, I'm not advocating uh, cession of territory or anything like that. But I would say that another thing is that one of the major arguments against appeasement, which we've discussed this morning, and which is in, is in the book so much, is that if you appease so-and-so at this moment, you're only encouraging them. I do not believe for a second that if, the, if a negotiation was able to happen on whatever basis and the war ended, that Putin would be encouraged. He has been resoundingly defeated. He has been humiliated on the world stage. His military has been shown to uh, be uh, essentially hollow. He's uh, lost an enormous amount of prestige and credibility. Would you not agree? It, it would not. I think he will think long and hard before, were this war to end tomorrow, before going into the Baltic states or somewhere else. I think that's true, but I think then the question, and again, you don't, we won't know until we have the benefit of historic hindsight, is do you keep going until Putin is removed or or is in that humiliating process, are you laying the, the uh, seeds for the next invasion or aggressive act by, by Russia? Do you give him an out or do you let this play out so that he is thoroughly defeated in Ukraine? And that is really an open question. So end on that note, I think we need to get to questions. So because there'll be great ideas, I'm sure, from this wonderful audience. Um, do we have? Thank you. Um, wonderful. And if you could stand up and wait for the microphone, that would be wonderful. Okay, we have a, we have a question here. Who has the mic? Here we are. Oh, there we go. Sorry, excuse me. There's one at the back and then we'll come up to you. Thank you so Sorry. much. Thank that you. was absolutely fascinating. I'm going to get that book and I'm going to read that book. But I'd like to ask you a question. Um, in your research, did you look at any of the movie tone films and I'm specifically referring to one that I believe was on July the 19th, 1943, where they showed pictures of the victims at Auschwitz, and I believe Buchenwald also. Um, it, uh, and I'm just wondering if you, uh, if you actually uh, researched any of that. Um, I have certainly seen footage of the liberation of uh, the death camps. I don't know whether I've seen, I couldn't tell you whether I've seen that specific footage that you're referring to. My book, um, I wasn't looking into the liberation of the death camps because that uh, is outside the time period of my book. My book goes from uh, 33 through to uh, the battle in the war cabinet between Churchill and Halifax about whether or not they should enter into any sort of negotiations with Hitler following Dunkirk and the imminent fall of France because Churchill's victory then meant that it was either win or die. Britain was either going to go on to victory or Britain was going to be invaded. Any possible negotiations with the Nazis were then out of the question. So I, didn't, I haven't gone into uh, 1943. It's out of the scope, I'm afraid, of, of the appeasement subject that I had. Wonderful. OK, another question. Oops, excuse me. I think we'll have to go to another question up here since we have such little time. Yes. Uh, what an outstanding book. Uh, so thoroughly researched. I loved the book. It was tremendous. Would you comment on China? Because there's an, another interesting book that's just come out about the future of the United States relationship with China. And there's some history recent of appeasement, if you will. And what lessons can we learn from World War II, although it's now almost 100 years later and we have nuclear bombs, uh, what alternatives, what off-ramps are available 
because I think that's what we need to look at, not, not just should we uh, saber rattle uh, or walk away. So could you comment on potential problems with our, the biggest country in the world? I, well, I'd like to defer to J Jennifer on that really easy question. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, 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 I, but all I would say, it's an incredibly difficult thing, and I, I, I'm not an expert on uh, contemporary relations with China at all. All I would say as, as a historian and linking to the period is, again, the signs that the policy pursued by over the last 20 years by US presidents and the West in general of it's all going to be fine because they've got McDonald's over there and they're buying American uh, trainers. And th that th the signs that that policy wasn't going to work, I think, have been clear uh, a, a lot sooner than um, it, it, the West took a while to catch up to the, the fact that their strategy was not working and that uh, the Communist Party was, if anything, becoming more entrenched and threats to uh, either the separate status of Hong Kong or to uh, Taiwan uh, were very real and required a real response. I think you could, the closest analogy I think you could get to is, is not actually my period. It would be more uh, the height, some of the heights of the Cold War, which is to have to have a very robust twin, a very robust response which I believe was uh, Ronald Reagan's policy, with a willingness to talk, a willingness to uh, have negotiations and improve relations where they actually can be due, but and yet at the same time showing that you're not too frightened. Right? But I, I couldn't pretend to have a better answer than that. So I'll answer as a journalist, not as a historian, since journalists write the first rough draft of history, and it's usually wrong. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I see right now is that uh, President Xi is watching what's happening in Ukraine very closely. He's watching the response. He's watching, first of all, he's horrified by how weak his ally Putin is and how the military, the Russian military, is folding pretty readily um, with some US and, and NATO weapons flowing in and the will to fight of the Ukrainian people. So he's watching that. He's been very disciplined about not providing weapons to Putin. Uh, but at the same time, I think he also knows that the West doesn't do really well with two fronts and doesn't do well at walking and chewing gum at the same time sometimes. And so he may use this period of distraction while uh, the US and allies are focusing on Ukraine and very worried about Putin to make a sudden move on Taiwan. And so I think either of those two, either he will take the lesson that going into Taiwan will lead to uh, he, he will find himself in a similar position as Putin in that it's going to be a very, uh, he will become isolated, the, the kind of, there will not necessarily be a hot war over it or, or um, a war with militaries, but it will be a trade war, it will be an isolation, it will be the, the it could definitely be a, mis a mistake that ends his uh, plans for being sort of premier for life. So I think we don't know how it will happen, and that is why a united front deterrence, uh, military, the, a credible military response has to be part of the picture. Um, so I think we're in a very, very uncertain time, but deterrence is, is very important, but we have learned from history that it is very difficult as democracies to deter these dictators, and, and let's not kid ourselves, President Xi and President Putin, they are dictators. Yes, I'll try to make it quick. Um, the top Hitler people had two weird philosophies, fire and ice and inner earth theories. And it was so bizarre that it actually became like a litmus test of loyalty to Hitler to say that one followed those theories. Um, is there anything comparative going on in Putin land? Uh, is there any bizarre metaphysics that's happening there that is uh, influencing his uh, actions? I don't know that I have an answer for that. So it's, it's an interesting question. I think, um, I think we'll be studying uh, Vladimir Putin and his mind and the influences on him for a long time. 
and I think, unfortunately, we ignored him at our peril for, for too long. I think, I think, I think he, he's uh, very close to the, uh, a particular uh, Russian uh, Orthodox patriarch who possibly is playing a more uh, a Rasputin-like role with him, and I read somewhere that he was taken for some sort of cleansing ceremony where he had a bath in ox blood or something like that. So I think um, the, um, the, he, an interest in the occults and things which was very much present in the Führer bunker in the last days of the Third Reich uh, is not beyond the realms of possibility. But he is apparently a deeply, deeply religious man, which is always uh, very difficult if people think that they're d doing God's will. <laughs> okay, um, we're about at the end of our time, so I just want to, we have one more question in the front row, but I think we can squeeze in, but thank you. This has been amazing. I have a very loud voice. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Oh. No, I was wondering um, if when all the saber rattling started from Putin, what if NATO and um, the United States had... Um, lined up all of their war machines along the Ukrainian border and just said, like the schoolyard bully, don't come in. What would Putin have really done? He could have threatened a lot of things, but what would he really do? Well, I, I don't, we don't know for certain what he would have done, but I, the, the only thing I suppose we can say is that we do know that Putin did not expect Ukraine to rally around Zelensky and fight, and he also did not expect NATO uh, who, which had been undermined by European nations not spending on it and American presidents being very rude about it and, uh, other, and, and other uh, events which happened in Europe creating disunity among allies. Nobody, he didn't expect, people in the West didn't, I think, expect the resolve of the NATO response. So if that, and th this has caught him unaware, so if, there, if he had been made aware that there was going to be a much greater response, then one can only hope that there w would be a greater chance of him, of him being deterred, because he certainly wasn't deterred by uh, all of the events that I've just mentioned, which I think purely encouraged him. Well, I also think that we're benefiting from six months of hindsight. Nobody knew at the time, because I was in the Pentagon at the time, uh, nobody knew that the Russian military would do so badly. Nobody knew that the Ukrainians would fight so hard. And so there was a belief in the beginning, in uh, late February, that uh, Kyiv could fall within uh, several weeks. And, and the US and others did not want to go to war with nuclear Russia. Now, what we've seen is a very weak Russia, but, but Russia still has a lot of military power. And, and even the nuclear, if Russia did not have nuclear weapons, this would have been a different story. Of course, the, the West would have probably militarily uh, gone to the brink over this. But remember, the, it, the question mark was nuclear weapons and still is. Thank you, Tim. This Thank was you, amazing. Thank you very amazing. Much. Lovely. Oh. Wonderful. Um, I, I just I just think you may be interested to know what they're doing next. So um, Tim is writing a sequel to his book on appeasement, which will we ho hope will be featuring in the festival in a couple of years' time. Um, and he's going to focus on the on the um, collaboration and divisions of the Allies um, during the uh, um, during the period of the Second World War. Um, Jennifer will probably be going back to the Ukraine, uh, uh, reporting from the Ukraine where her husband is now. And finally, Tim will be signing books at the Buxton bookstall afterwards. Thank you both very much.